Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're learning how scientists, cultural practitioners, and community members are working together to understand and adapt to the effects of climate change. We investigate the relationship between a changing environment and water quality in local fish ponds, as well as the relationship between changing ocean conditions and people's personal connection to place. We start off on the Big Island of Hawaii at Honokea Lokoia with UH Hilo graduate students and fish pond caretakers, Sherry Kawahi and Kamala Anthony. We are at Waiuli, specifically where we're located right now is Honokea Loko, is the name of the fish pond. In 2011, my friends and I started to take care of the fish pond. We learned that um, this fish pond could provide essentially um, a lifestyle and uh, a career path for us. And so that's when we started to just build up the rock walls again and start to understand the system better and introduce um, the kids in the community to this place and help them join and have them join in and help us build up and um, restore the fish pond. We're gaining these skills from different professors and different expertise, even cultural um, experts on how Lokoya operate. And then we're kind of opening it up to the schools to say, hey, come, we're going to teach you what we have learned about these places. So one of my projects is just like understanding the growth rate in different salinity regions to see like that influence of salt water within these systems. So I have these tile sets and they're set up where fish can feed on some and then fish can't feed on some. I deploy them for like six days and then I take them out and kind of scrape it and then I'm going to process them in the lab to see like is there a difference amongst those different salinity regions within the fish pond um, when it comes to the growth rate of the of the food that the fish are eating. Yeah. So some of the algae is more tolerant to the salt than other algae. Yeah, and it's just like even looking at what those varieties are and which ones are the ones that are maybe favored or most um, desired by the fish too is another. Yeah. It's like opening up more and more questions like the more we, we carry out these yeah. experiments. Yeah. It is a functioning fish pond. We haven't been able to harvest. We're really right at the stage of nursery management, just understanding who's living here, who thrives here, but eventually we'll wanna um, be able to be fully functioning where we're, we're capturing and harvesting fish. You will find different species in here versus right, even right outside the wall. So the things that can handle, that really thrive in here are hapavai, which is our brackish water snail. Uh, we also have o'opu akupa, which is our Hawaiian gobi. And then we also have our Hawaiian mullet, the ama ama, and we have our alamihi, which is our Hawaiian brackish water crabs. And we have ahole hole, which is Hawaiian flagtail. And then we have those random little reef fish that can come in and handle, but they don't, not a lot of them come in, just like the manini and the hinalea and those sorts of things. Oh, opai, shrimp, sorry. Don't forget about our shrimp. We have two different kinds of opai. And yeah, they live in here. Limu. Yeah, there are different varieties of limu that we haven't been able to identify yet that the fish are definitely feed on because that's why they stay in here. I'm a grad student. I come down and help on community work days, but also just collecting data and stuff for my project. Trying to understand how much fresh water there is, how does it move within the fish pond, and how is that gonna change with you know, climate change, sea level rise, and stuff like that. One of the most interesting things that we'll probably see with all of this data that we're getting is like the fluxes of nutrients or the pulses of nutrients that we may or may not see with um, changes in rainfall. We've been experiencing some heavy downpours and then it stops of rain, then it downpours and then it stops. And so what does that look like as far as nutrients pulsing out of the springs here? Is it just gushing out and then stopping? And then how does that change the ecosystem? We did identify the springs along the coast here. And one of the cool things that we're gonna look at, as well as in the fish ponds, is the isotopes in determining what elevation the water's coming from. Knowing where the water's coming from up Mauka, you know, how can we malama the watershed or the ahupua'a in order to make sure that that water's good for these fish ponds? Each fish pond is designated to like specific group of caretakers. And then with the students that come and visit, they visit all of the fish ponds that we are studying. So they come um, monthly, weekly, and they visit all of the fish ponds. It creates like a stronger network throughout all of us. We all want the same goal is to take care of this place so that, you know, we can 
it can care for us. What's been really not surprising, but really helpful um, and encouraging and enlightening for this project is that we are able to collaborate and connect and yeah. see where people's expertise come into play so that we can start to our, organize ourselves and, and know our neighbors better and know our community better, better and know our university system better so that we can support each other in these type of um, the roles that we take on this place that we live. Communication is everything, especially when you're doing an effort such as Lokoia, because it, in the past, the Lokoia was a reflection on the community. If your community, if your, your Lokoia was thriving, you, your fish pond was thriving, then that means your community was thriving. And so um, we like to keep that in the back of our head all the time in, in everything that we carry out. We talk about climate change, you know, and how the environment's changing, how the rainfall's changing, how the surf's changing. I think what's really important is to understand that it's social change maybe that needs to happen when it comes to Lokoia. There's so many different people from so many different places, so many different backgrounds. We got scientists, people who's from here, you know, me who was born and raised here, but you know, haven't been down here my whole life. Like we all have these different perspectives and understanding and knowing that each perspective is important and knowing that with climate change, we also need to recognize the social changes that need to happen and the acknowledgement of other people and their perspectives. Oftentimes we're always asked this question, how do you bridge that gap between cultural knowledge or cultural practice and um, science inquiry, right? That's all, all the time. And it's and the way we look at it is what we realize through this process is that it's all it's all the same, you know? The, we don't separate them. We we can't separate them because it's just a, like Sheree said, it's just a different way of viewing yeah. this place, you know? And if, if your goal is to take care of this place, then those things will come in between. And what we realize is that in order to bridge that gap, you have to be that gap. And I think that's where we've been really successful. It's just being that gap to say, okay, I'll be the middleman, the communicator between the scientists, between the community, because we have to, we don't have no choice. We are the people in the university. We are the people at the fish farm. We are the people taking down the data. We are the people interpreting the data. So it's just like filling those gaps and being those gaps rather than thinking about how we are going to create or, you know, find that gap yeah. in a sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Be the change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. That's a good one. These fish ponds are a balance of fresh water coming from groundwater flowing into them and seawater that fluctuates with the tides. The fresh water brings in nutrients that feeds the algae, that feed the fish, so we have that part. The seawater, well, it tends to be warmer than our groundwater here. Uh, the groundwater is fairly cool. The algae grows slowly there, but in the warmer parts, uh, the algae may grow faster. So we're looking at those differences between the salinity and the temperature in these ponds. It also tells us how the water is circulating in these ponds. The pond we're standing at today, we were measuring flow rates, how fast the water was flowing out. We found out that every five hours, this pond is being replaced with fresh water. It's like a river. It doesn't look like a river, but it's like a river of water coming out here. So for this project, we have three different locoia, three different fish ponds that we're studying, each with different characteristics, different amounts of fresh water coming in, different amounts of connectivity to the open ocean. This one's kind of a intermediate, our intermediate scenario. With climate change, we're going to have rising sea levels. The sea level, that's going to push more salt water into these ponds, but you can't move back. You can't move the water upstream like you're in a river. We have this confined space here. So they call it a, a shrinking estuary. The size of the estuary um, is, is getting smaller with sea level rise here. The other part of climate change is the changes in rainfall uh, up mountain. Uh, this area is predicted to have uh, increased rainfall. We're going to be working on quantifying that with this project. To start off is to look at can we identify an individual rain event and see that signature here in the ponds. It's easy to get lost in the weeds of okay, what exactly is gonna happen in the future? Or tell me right here in this place in two years, how's the water level gonna change? How's the chemistry gonna change? At the end of the day, if you scale up to say long-term evolutionary history of our species, we've always needed each other. 
So the more that we can get to know our neighbors, our professional worker, expand our networks, not only of managers, of researchers, but of community members, um, the more we're building that ability to adapt through each other and building that, those networks of, that trust one another through times of change. If you have only one small segment that you're interacting with in your community of, say, an overall uh, larger town or state um, of managers and researchers or cultural practitioners, if you're only working with a narrow component, you're diminishing uh, the, your adaptive capacity. The more you open that up into broader and broader networks, the more you're building your adaptive capacity to, during change. The community is directly involved in the management of this fish pond. So you, you don't have just a handful of managers. It takes hundreds of individuals to maintain this wall. Also something very unique here is at this location, these practices of local IA management have not been going on for decades or even a century, but many centuries. We're talking about managers that have been handing down knowledge from experience for hundreds of years. And to build on that or to support that to major times of change, that's adaptation. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Rosie Alegato about her work studying the microbial health of Hawaiian fish ponds and how the historical records found in the Hawaiian language newspapers are used in her research. Hawaiian fish ponds um, in particular are pretty unique because um, they have this innovation where you have a wall called a kuapa and you have these sluice gates called makaha. And makaha means Ha means breath or essence, and maka is the eyes. So the eyes of the fish pond are breathing the water, and so it's a place where you have water exchange of fresh and salt water, creating really large brackish water environments that promote uh, the growth of microalgae, or diatoms and cyanobacteria, as well as macroalgae. And these are really great for fish, which is what the purpose of the fish pond was. These completely dotted all the Hawaiian islands. There are about 488 fish ponds known from archeological records. These are all opportunities for us to kind of go and reconstruct what might have happened along the coastlines. Having all of this really long-term data allowed us to identify actually the window of time that was pretty dangerous for the fish pond. So we were able to see, show that if you have no trade winds for at least five days, you need to start thinking about moving the fish out of the area, like releasing them or harvesting them, um, especially in conjunction with high temperatures. That's, that that wind-driven mixing is so vitally important for the fish to have oxygen. That five days of no, no trade winds, not only are we miserable, but the fish are super miserable as well. There were these practices, it's called hehi hehi, so you would literally go and like stomp around in the mud on an outgoing tide and it would just take the sediment away. And it wasn't like tons, so it wasn't like killing the reef, but it was still this way to clean up the fish pond. There's also evidence of people would be in a canoe and you would tie like a, um, a, a coconut leaf to the back and you would basically like sweep your fish pond on an outgoing tide. Um, again, you, you want some, some mud, but not as much certainly as there is now. Yeah, because you want to have it photosynthetic all the way to the benthos and you're like, you know. Land use change in Hawaii has really, really affected the health of our estuaries. You know, you didn't have all of this runoff coming from the land because you had a lot more taro patches that were acting as these great settlement basins. You had active management of your stream systems because you had lunawai who were active water supervisors making sure that, you know, the streams were healthy, nothing was getting clogged up. And so you had really great connectivity between the land and the ocean to make sure that what was coming out of at the bottom at the estuary, the muliwai was really, really clean. And so it didn't negatively impact the, um, the health of the reef. Because of a lot of development and urbanization, as well as other kinds of sedimentation, uh, that balance is off right now. But there's the potential for us to restore those ecosystems and uh, increase productivity of these places so that we can provide food for our local population.
University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're at Honolii Beach Park, talking about social adaptations to changing environments with Dr. Noalani punuvai Ganu and local caretaker, Brada Skibbs. Honolii is in Ahupua'a in the Hilopaliku Moku here on Hawaii Island. And it is the probably most well-known surf spot that we have on the Hilo side. It's been around since Pele and Hi'iaka. They surfed here back in the Wakahiko. Honolii has stories about it from our ancient past until today. I mean, my keiki come here and surf. The students and the children from all around Hilo have grown up surfing here. Um, and so I wanted to find a place that people were connected to and see how it changes through time and how you can understand the environment and people as we grow and change through time. Honolii was a spot where I thought I could really understand people's knowledge about the ocean. Um, and how they think it's been changing through time. And in that way, kind of understand how is climate change affecting us or how has it affected us in the past? What we've seen in the last 30 years is we've had a decrease in trade winds here in Hilo. And that decrease in trade winds has brought us decreased rainfall and decreased stream flow. And so all of those conditions lead to um, building up of like large sandbars here in the river where you can almost walk across the entire river. Um, it changes the way the waves are able to build up or if there's a long shoal. What we've also seen is the direction of the swells that hit Hawaii have been changing. And so we're getting more of northern swells um, as those storm tracks change. So we're not getting our consistent trade wind swells. What all those things tell us is that it has been shifting and changing for a long time and it's not as consistent as it was in the past. So the physical conditions are gonna to continue to change. Um, and I think what's interesting to note is a lot of people, they don't realize how those swells have been changing through time until you talk to them about it. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we have get really awesome winter swells now, but our summers have been super flat. I had a lot of students that were um, from this place and we started surveying, surveying different surfers. Mostly it was talk story in the beginning, trying to understand what questions worked for them. Um, and then once we figured out kind of what questions worked, we actually did a formal survey. So we came out here um, over a course of three months and surveyed of 100 surfers. And so we surveyed people from the age of 18 to 80. No matter what age the surfer was, no matter what skill they had, no matter um, kind of um, like if they really want big waves or small waves, they were able to explain the wave conditions really well. So they're good observers of the condition here. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them how surf was in the past, they had different answers for that. And so they observed how the conditions have been changing through time differently, um, different than each other. We looked at their age, um, where they lived, how long they've surfed at this particular spot versus if they've surfed a long time but at different spots. And all those things didn't really make a difference. The key variable that made a difference in how they reflected on it in the past is how they viewed this area personally. So their personal connection to the area, um, their social history of how they understood this area. So if you've surfed this place for a long time, you've known that it's gone through a lot of changes. When I was a kid, it was really overgrown. It was a really rough and tumble spot to come to. And so it was kind of had a really different um, atmosphere about it, where right now it's really family oriented, um, the beach part's taken care of. So when you ask people what makes the best surf conditions, they would always include, oh, I was out here with my best friends one day, or I came and the beach was, you know, it was really calm and there was hardly anybody here. And so all those answers that they're giving you tell you that the social condition is just as important as the physical waves that they came in that day. And people across the experience and the skill level all told you the same thing. Um, it really matters kind of the unknown that you bring to the ocean and the fact that the ocean has its own sort of spirit that helps kind of interact with that physical condition that gives you what we call surf quality. 
And so when you relate that to climate change, climate change is something that you're going to feel, but your reaction to that is based on how you interact with those places through time. And so that's what the surf is telling us. Even if the physical conditions are so-called maybe decreasing through time, because the social conditions are balancing that out, people still have the same um, enjoyment of the surf here. I think that's so interesting because that was, before talking to you, that was the aspect of your study that I thought, well, how can she get valid information out of these surfers because it's such a personal thing? And then your answer is, it's such a personal thing <laughs> and that's what's valuable. Yeah. And so it's really like, you flip the whole question on its head. Yeah, and it's not what I expected to. I thought, you know, people who've been here for a long time will be able to tell me exactly how the conditions have changed, and that would be very different than people who haven't been here for a very long time. And that's not what it showed. It showed that, you know, the place has changed just as you've grown up. So you can still enjoy surfing through climate change. And so it just gives you that positive aspect that we're resilient people. Um, and we might have said, oh, the surf's getting junk and the place is degrading, we're going to go find somewhere else. But instead, we said, well, it doesn't matter if the surf's going down. If we can make ourselves a part of this environment and really love it and become part of it, then we're going to love the conditions as it changes with us. So they kind of take a more proactive approach to being a part of their environment. Um, and I think that's a good message for climate change. I think as we get more connected to our environment and understand what's going on, um, we'll be able to tackle it positively and not just always feel scared about climate change and you know, just really feeling the negative effects that we think it's going to bring. And the more you take observations and start modeling it, um, the more we are all a part of our environment and the more we can all understand how climate change is affecting us. What do you see Honolii being like in 5, 10, 20, 50 years? Yeah. So over the last five or 10 years, Honolulu Pakalev has been caretaking this area and making it more of a spot for children. And I see that movement continuing, um, not just in the fact that the site will be more for kids, but that the people of the area will start taking care and um, being the ones to malama this place as it moves forward. If we start losing our connection to places, then we're not gonna care that our environment's changing. So if we have these areas that we can connect to, as our world continues to change, these areas will still be really important to us. Okay, so we ready? Oh yeah, so tell me about your organization. Okay, our organization is called Basic Image. We are a nonprofit organization where we go out into beach areas, we adopt the area, and we educate people how to malama to take care free. That's what we do. So we be an example, we came here as, as for Honolulu. This place was really overgrown, was all bushes. So we went to the mayor, asked the mayor if we could do this, and he was stoked, but he said, they don't own the land. Come me a school owner, Bishop of State. So we called Bishop of State. One month later, we had a meeting. This was in 2003. And uh, come here, school wanted to know what I'm gonna do with this. I said, I wanna make a living classroom. I wanna educate the kids about culture, about ocean, about river, about coexist, about all these things at this place. So they said, okay, but we adopted this part. So we malama on a weekly basis and on the weekends, we have kids come down that surf and we educate them how to coexist. You know, like I said, teaching them about why we doing this. So that's what I hear for, you know, just share that because I'm 61 years old. I feel like I'm 20. I love my <laughs> life, you know what I mean? I stay here cleaning, meeting people, helping the kids go surf. I said, come on, we gotta share this so these other people can understand this so they can live their life better. So that's all I'm really here for, is just to be an example of what I was taught and to do it, and I'm blessed to be a caretaker of this place. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher.